Hi to everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Plenary B. Uh, the title of the Plenary is Contemporary Capitalism and Unequal Society, Obscene Exchange, Complicity, and Grassroots Responses. Just a few words to explain the title of the Plenary. Um, well, obviously we are going to talk about contemporary capitalism and in particular neoliberal regime is, you know, as you know, it's, it's been uh, among us for a long time than the uh, Fordism period. And uh, uh, obscene exchange, because Noah Yoran from the University of Italy is going to talk about that. And, and uh, complicity uh, is the word that we have chosen to express in, in a synthetic term, the, uh, the content of uh, Deborah James' talk. And the grassroots responses refers to the lecture of, of Susanna Narowski. And uh, so uh, each talk will probably last about 20, 30 minutes. And at the end of the uh, three talks, we will accept questions. Uh, and at the moment, therefore, the order will be uh, Susanna, uh, Deborah, and Noan. Uh, but before they start, uh, Silvia Vignato will give a brief introduction of each uh, uh, special guest for today. Thanks. So the first, our first speaker is Susanna Naroski, who is professor of social anthropology at the University of Barcelona in Spain. She founded in 1998 the study group on reciprocity at the University of Barcelona and is uh, now the winner of an ERC advanced grant with a project on grassroots economics and her main research focus has been on the anthropology of work with particular attention to unregulated production and care practices within and across generations. Thank you. Um, I first of all want to thank the organizers for a great conference uh, and uh, especially I want to thank Simone Getzi for inviting me to participate in this plenary. Uh, and now I'm going to get into the, in, into the presentation I want to give you. It has a very complicated title, but I think, I hope you, you will uh, understand what I'm trying to say here. So during the Indignados 15th of May movement in 2011 in Spain, the people's assemblies in uh, Sol Madrid and Barcelona Plaza de Catalunya gathered demands and suggestions from participants. In Barcelona, the demands agreed, agreed by the General Assembly were ranked by order of importance as follows. No privileges for politicians, no privileges for bankers, no privileges for big fortunes, the rich, dignity and salaries and quality of life, right to housing, quality public services, especially health and education, liberties and participatory democracy, and the environment. In Madrid, the Acampada Sol accepted suggestions from participants for several months. It received some 14,700 contributions that were subsequently organized and analyzed. The most recurrent claims, with over 600 mentions, were, quote, suppression of political privilege, reform of the election system, and control of corruption. This was followed by demands for public education, better labor conditions, and financial regulation. The main focuses of this participate uh, of, of those participating in the po uh, popular assemblies were undue privilege, economic welfare, and social rights. They underscore the political within the economic. They discredit the view of a purely technocratic tackling of the, eco um, uh, of the economic crisis. They question the neoliberal discourse that the state's intervention in the economy should be minimized for achieving an optimal allocation of resources but they also challenge 
the perception that in the post-1980s political economic conjuncture of Europe, the state has effectively rolled back that it is intervening less. Indeed, the power of the state is not withering away. On the contrary, it is pervasive in its business-friendly regulations while it clamps down on socially redistributive and labor protective practices. It operates on behalf of a small constituency of individual and corporate wealth holders. Nowhere is this collusion more obvious than in the bailing out of banks, the endless corruption scandals, and in the double standard uh, regarding taxation and tax evasion standards, uh, uh, sanctions. Each of these uh, three issues highlighted in the assemblies, undue privilege, economic welfare, and social rights, presents a different angle of the articulation of political power and economic power and how it affects ordinary people. It points to the tension between the liberal ideology of individual equality, the alleged aim of democratic polities, and a pervasive illiberal practice that defines communities of privilege and produces barriers to entry against competitors. In the European Union, the political discourse of mainstream parties uh, social Democrats and liberal conservatives alike, has stressed the liberalization of the market, free trade, and labor deregulation. As we know, this liberal argument comes in the same package as individual equality. In theory, stripped out of privilege, the market would be an equalizer. Uh, it would facilitate access to needed resources at the lowest cost, and thus it would expand welfare in the long run. However, one of the main tenets of this liberal package is a privilege, private property. This initial contradiction between equality and privilege recurrently emerges around the question of redistribution of resources or assets and its consequences for equality of opportunities, equality of outcome, and social mobility. The classical socialist attack on private property of the means of production was aimed at the elimination of the ultimate privilege, private property, one that was responsible for structuring relations of production in a way that enabled the capture of surplus value. In the present, an analogous understanding drives social movements to claim for the commons, a notion that encompasses a wide array of services, rights, and spaces, public health and education, labor rights, housing, and public spaces. Here also, the fight against deregulation and privatization, against the new enclosures movement, is understood fundamentally as the fight against the imposition of privilege of access. In this presentation, I want to dwell on the issue of privilege as it emerges with force in austerity periods. A first section will present some grassroots reactions uh, that I have encountered in my fieldwork in Spain, uh, I will briefly showcase the contradiction between struggles that aim to open the access to resources equally to all and practices seeking to capture micro-rent privileges by profiting from producing or enforcing entry barriers. A second section will underline the tension between competitive and monopoly capitalism, their articulation, the ascent of monopolistic forms in the financialized era, and the role of the state. A concluding section will point to the logical correspondence between people's everyday uh, practices and present-day 
politics of capital accumulation. Now I'm going to present a little bit of an, uh, the ethnography, uh, which is at the base of this reflection. I have been doing fieldwork for over 10 years in Ferrol, an industrial town in the northwest region of Spain. For a long time, shipyards were the main source of employment for men, while women mostly work in fish processing factories, small shops, education and health services, uh, or were home workers. Directly or indirectly, the shipyards generated most local income. Starting in the 1980s and following the general trend in Europe, the shipyards were restructured and thousands of jobs were lost. This trend has continued through various moments of restructuring um, until the present. Unskilled and poorly paid services jobs have increased and small and medium enterprises linked to construction, apparel, logistics, and service sectors surround the town. Today, the area has over 30% unemployment, well above the national uh, uh, rate. Many in the younger generation uh, holding temporary precarious jobs rely on income transfers, home shelter, or care work from their retired parents. And the lucky ones migrate. This was the context that pushed many precariously employed local people to join the marches, uh, Marchas de la Dignidad, uh, Marches uh, uh, for Dignity. These marches converged on March 22, 2014 in Madrid and gathered over a million people from different regions in Spain. Under the slogan, Pan, Trabajo, Techo y Dignidad, uh, bread, work, uh, housing, and dignity, the marches protested against austerity measures, labor reform, mortgage foreclosures, and corruption. In Ferrol, these marches for dignity have been organized by various civic associations. In, the one, of the, in one of the preparatory mobilizations before the march uh, uh, to Madrid in 2014, Juan, a retired shipyard worker and union member spoke of the militant citizen that needs to emerge and made an appeal to occupy the city streets and squares. He spoke of the younger generations without work and living off their parents' retirement pensions and pointed to the fact that these pensions will disappear in the near future as the older generation dies out. Juan defined universal public provisioning of quality health care, education, and public services as the social conquests that are being attacked through austerity and covert privatization. For Juan and many of his peers, austerity measures are the organized dispossession of something that was achieved as a form of common good through workers' collective struggles in the past. A similar commitment to new forms of mobilization can be found in many political activists that started their career in the 1970s. So Juan is not an exception. When I met Juan again a year later in 2015, he was dismayed because the impetus that mobilized people in 2014, uh, into, in the 2014 marches, had disappeared. In September of 2015, I attended a small local meeting of the activists that organized the marches. There, Laura, uh, in her 60s, a longtime radical nationalist, pointed out that their role is to push people to go beyond solidarity with particular issues and towards a convergence of the many struggles. She said, and this is a quote, the marches provide a space for unifying different struggles. We should not get lost in small actions that can be left to other uh, groups. The marches' role is to unify against austericidal policies. End of quote. This group of activists point to the sovereign debt incurred in the bailing out of the banking system as the main cause of the crisis, and they oppose the payment of the debt. The, the, their claims are full employment, social benefits for all, a basic income, public health and education of quality, 
and the right uh, to housing. However, this local group recognized that practical results were virtually non-existent. People did not respond to the organizers' call to demonstrate in solidarity with other mobilizations. This committed group of activists is in tune with the 2000 indigna, uh, 2011 indignados claims against privilege that we saw at the beginning. Uh, they seek to regain social rights and stress the common root of the many problems that people face to make a living. Finally, they identify rent capture through sovereign debt obligations as the major cause uh, behind the regressive policies imposed through austerity. Laura is also one of the organizers of the Barter Shop, a local cooperative that recycles used clothes and trades them for free. She recognizes that the Solidarity Initiative has lost momentum in the last year as people are withdrawing into themselves. This echoes what many repeat, there is little solidarity. Antonio, 28, a technical design engineer who has been unemployed except for a two-month uh, contract and lives with his mother, asserts, we are selfish, we only think of our own problem and the rest we don't care. Meanwhile, the family becomes a re refuge of last resort and many young people come back to their parents after many years of independent life. This is the case of Juan's son, who is 37, a journalist who worked in a regional newspaper in a larger city. For 15 years after he graduated, he was independent, lived on his income and rented an apartment. He lost his job two years ago and has been unable to find anything providing a minimum, a minimum stable income. He is now living at his parents' small apartment uh, sleeping in his teenage bed that he sometimes shares with his girlfriend. Uh, he looks for temp jobs through acquaintances, but he's mostly idle. Juan defines young people like his son as internal refugees because they take refuge in the parents' home and they don't confront the real problems that are destroying them. He declares, and this is a long quote, they come in search of a home, of food, of any work we can provide. We help them because we care for them, because they are our children. But our children could be other people's children. And to be coherent, we should open our home to others that are not our children. But we do it only for our children. I think we are doing the wrong thing. This is not the alternative. This is an historical mistake. What we are doing helps perpetuate those in power. According to Juan, his son criticize, criticizes everything, but he does nothing to change it. He doesn't go out, gets together with others in this situation, collectively mobilize. And he doesn't do it because we have him with us. The privileged entry to the family safety net gives access to resources, but contributes to demobilize. Carmen, the mother, points to the constant conflicts that cohabitation creates, conflicts around household chores, autonomy, sexuality, pocket money, idleness. She adds, uh, another quote, nobody is happy with the situation. He is no longer happy living with us, and we are no longer happy having him here. He suffers when he asks, and suffers that we give him, knowing that we deprive ourselves in his behalf. With austerity pension cuts, resources are getting scarcer, and they have another daughter with a small child that they also give some money to. But mostly Carmen is exhausted and anxious about the future, about what will happen to their son when they are no longer around to help. She imagines him homeless and relying on charity, this fear pushes her to protect household resources from others in what she recognizes as a lack of solidarity with those who may be in greater need. These situations present a different picture from that of the March's activists. Collective solidarity gives way to withdrawal into the family. 
Here, the use of proximity networks to distribute resources displaces conflict into the intimate space of the home, even as it activates micro-privileged strategies of closure. Now, I, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about competition and monopoly. I know I don't have much time, but I, I think I have enough time. Um, the mythical account of the origins of capitalism is based on the abolition of privileges and of the power to enforce them. In the new regime, private property was conceptually linked with work, becoming a d direct reward of personal effort and not a hereditary source of unearned income and further privilege. Liberal revolutions and struggles for enfranchisement and access to resources resulted in a complex mapping of tensions between drives toward equality and struggles for retaining or reconfiguring forms of privilege. Viewed from this perspective, competitive capitalism is the canonical form, while monopoly capitalism is a residual or perverse form. Indeed, monopoly capitalism thrives on rent capture. That is, profits do not come from the production of surplus value or as a return for costs incurred. Rather, rent is the result of privileged returns and is defined as the capture of unearned income that is not referred to work or uh, costs. It is fundamentally related to circulation, barriers to entry, and toll booth charges. On the contrary, competitive capitalism is based on free circulation and on trammeled supply and demand price setting mechanisms. It is supposed to provide the grounds for the optimal allocation of limited resources as costs are driven down and prices will benefit consumers. If monopoly appears as linked to the political power needed to enforce differences and carve out protected spaces, competition appears as dependent on the political power to level the playing field for economic actors and enforce freedom of circulation. So it's two very different kinds of um, processes. Competition provides the basic ideological argument for setting policies that reduce protective regulation and subsidies. This rolling back of the state will result in cost reduction and improved productivity, presented in turn as the key to gaining market shares in a competitive environment. However, these competitive policies are mostly targeted to particularly vulnerable groups of economic agents, not to everybody in the same way. Uh, namely, labor, the safe employed, and small firms. Large corporate firms are able to lobby effectively and corrupt policymakers into regulating all sorts of privileges. These include the so-called business-friendly environments, tax breaks, state contracts, land rezoning, and bailouts, as well as the imposition of product standards, which is a, a, a very a useful form of regulation that becomes an effective barrier to possible uh, competition. Some concepts, such as unfair competition and social dumping, for example, are re regularly used by corporate lobbyists as arguments to reinstate tariff barriers, often on a vague self-serving uh, grounds. Privilege, uh, privileges for corporate firms also include effective tolerance of a wide range of legal loopholes that enable siphoning profits without paying taxes. We know about all this. This results in a double-faced situation. On the one hand, petty capitalist firms and labor are indeed increasingly forced into a despotic market situation of unfettered competition. On the other hand, large corporate groups enter the market from a position of privilege that enables them to secure market shares on grounds other than competition. 
Generally speaking, reaping monopoly rents is the aim of all individualist, uh, individual capitalist firms. They seek to control the market to their benefit by pushing competitors aside and hence becoming price makers uh, by whatever means. Finally, the growth of the finance insurer, insurance insurance real estate sector in present-day capitalism, together with the exponential increase of e-commerce and internet service providing platforms, is directly responsible for the rise of rent profit as opposed to surplus value profit in practices of capital accumulation. What I want to underline in this section is that capitalism has always combined an ideology and a practice of competition with the continuous objective of reaping monopoly rents and limiting competition through diverse forms of political leverage. Moreover, these two processes have generally characterized the environment for different kinds of actors in relation to their power to set the rules of the game. The greater the power they can yield, the more privilege they can obtain, and the less competition will affect them. This is true for firms, but also for labor, as powerful unions and professional guilds evidence through the creation of internal or protected labor markets. Why is this relevant now? Neoliberal ideology recurrently voices the idea of individual and corporate freedom from state interference as the objective of pure capitalism. On the contrary, we are witnessing today a move toward an illiberal form of capitalism in which the state is a major player in the regulation of privilege for economic actors. The state produces privileges for big corporations and the rich instead of increasing equal opportunity by redistributing assets through public services, for example. This negates in practice both the liberal ideology of equality and the postulate of freedom from state intervention. Indeed, it encourages the creation of status groups and brokerage networks that promote inequality and dependency. Two consequences are extremely important. The first, competitive market frameworks are selectively enforced on powerless actors, while monopoly privilege is instituted for the powerful. And second, actors are shifting from struggles around exploitation, that is, labor capital uh, uh, and class struggles to struggles for privilege that define boundaries of inclusion and exclusion of access. In conclusion, less powerful actors experience and understand this new reality of an increasingly illiberal capitalism as a betrayal of the liberal promise of equal opportunity fostered through public spending in basic services and by preventing privilege. As these promises are not being kept, people address two contradictory claims to the state. The first is the elimination of privileges of the powerful economic actors, that is bankers, the rich, corrupt politicians. This is what we can see in these activist movements. Uh, and the second, uh, is the protection of citizenship rents through the exclusion of immigrants' entitlements and the closing of borders. Likewise, other forms of micro-privileges are sought in order to make a living. For example, using personal networks, mostly family and friends, provides resources analogous to rents. Petty tax avoidance expresses resistance to rent or tribute that the state captures. And searching for political leverage through local brokers helps access various kinds of public resources, information, preference of access, etc. These practices often signal retreat from collective mobilization, although they occasionally develop into mutual aid associations. They are simultaneously forms of re-embedding the economy, of using 
non-contractual obligations to get access to needed resources. The ambiguity and tension between exploiting kinship or friendship relations and developing reciprocal forms of support in a context of decreasing market opportunities is ubiquitous. As the, as the various monopoly tendencies of present day capitalism grow, resistance appears to be shifting away from collective mobilizations aiming at the expansion of equality and toward individual or segmented attempts at capturing micro privilege pools to get by. Against this inward looking strategy, activists who oppose privilege and stress the recuperation of the commons are again singling out equal access to resources as the core of systemic change. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. I would like to introduce uh, Deborah James, who is a specialist in the anthropology of South and Southern Africa and has recently begun research at some sites in the UK. Her work is uh, broadly political and economic in focus. She is currently directing an ESRC funded project entitled An Ethnography of Advice between market, society, and the declining welfare state. Um, she has recently published a book, uh, which is entitled Money from Nothing, Indebtedness and Aspiration in South Africa for Stanford University Press. Thank you, and thanks to both of you for inviting me to present here. Um, my topic, I think, is slightly different from what was said on the program. The word the complicity idea does come through a bit, but what I've also noticed, having gone to a few sessions at this conference, is how interestingly my topic today combines with two sort of streams of work that have been happening in the conference. One is about financialization and debt, the other one is about the household and sort of family relationships and how those then, somehow my, my topic brings these together. Um, like Susanna, I'm also talking about an area that might induce some activism, but mine is more about people who don't really get very active, although there are moments of that somewhere along the line. And I'm also talking about rent and unearned income. On skilled on Freck, Maro Jane Sequati once told me when I was doing my first fieldwork trip in the 1980s. This means we will be in debt until we die. She used Afrikaans, although she was a native Sepedi speaker, because her and her family had lived and worked as labor tenants on a white farm prior to being resettled in one of South Africa's infamous homelands. She was referring, with her term, to a government agricultural scheme that was providing inputs to small-scale cultivators, deducting repayments from their yield after the harvest, but always leaving them owing more than they could repay. In addition, they were also paying off a table and chairs bought on hire purchase from a furniture retailer in the nearest town in South Africa's peculiar system of what has been called credit apartheid. But these were not the family's only experiences of long-term um, obligation. They were also involved in a long chain of marriage payments and repayments, something that the, the region is very well known for. And although, in fact, for historians, um, for a long time, South Africa's economy was thought of as capitalist, this obscured the fact that there were people um, involved in kinds of customary wealth flows and obligations, which were largely invisible to sort of historians and, and economic historians. However, um, at the time of my fieldwork, people like this woman and her family had been cast on one side because the nature of South African capitalism had changed and there was no longer a massive demand for labor. Fast forward 35 years, democracy has arrived, apartheid has come to an end, and the economy has liberalized. Whatever growth has occurred in the 21st century no longer owes itself to gold or maize, which were the two forms of South African capital, but now financialization is the only game in town. And I discovered in my most recent fieldwork in both urban and rural settings that both the promise and the actuality of vastly improved circumstances and status have been brought by the transition. Policy analyst Ivor Chipkin uses the term middle classing to describe the sort of processual um, factor of this. So the likes of Maro Jane's children, like this person here, 
have become civil servants, nurses, teachers, and policemen, or senior office holders, um, employees in government departments, or senior office holders in companies and corporations. So many, but not all people in this bracket, some but not all of whom have moved swiftly upwards from semi-literate backgrounds, are typically in debt to the tune of hundreds of thousands of rands. And indeed, this is, in, this is how they came to be um, middle classes. So to bridge the gap between aspiration and its actualization, more of them need or want to borrow, and there is much more money available for lending. Many have taken up bank loans, own several credit cards, are buying um, on store cards from an array of retailers, and are paying back a vehicle finance company alongside the furniture retailers of earlier times, as well as having borrowed from other lenders, both formal or legal, so-called micro-lenders, and also informal, illegal, masonesas or loan sharks. Many also aspire to, even if they don't achieve, um, the goal of paying bride wealth and affording the mandatory white wedding that is supposed to accompany it. And the phrase used to describe their conundrum, uh, replacing we owe until we die, is we are now working for Mashonisa. In place of an execution, it suggests more a life sentence. But both statements seem to express a certain resignation. However, there's also moral ambiguity around it that was the, it was the route to upward mobility. Without this, there would have been very little of that. So let's go on to generation three very quickly and moving beyond the resignation. Uh, the likes of Margot Jane's great, sorry, grandchildren have a somewhat different experience of debt. A key experience for which, sorry, a key expense for which their parents borrowed was to pay for their university fees. Many have acquired a higher education, but they still owe money, either to the banks or to the university. And in the case of the latter, their degree certificates are being withheld. And recognizing that the promises of high status are hollow, if they can only be acquired on the never-never, they have joined the fees must fall movement that brought the university to sector to its knees in 2015, and that demanded and was granted, albeit only in provisional form, some kind of debt relief. So here we have evidence that there is some sort of activism going on and that the kind of self-blame that David Graeber shows usually accompanies getting into debt has at least partially been overcome. So here the death sentence and the life sentence appear to have been commuted or at least deferred. So in this paper, very briefly, I'm going to explore this three-generational debt shift with its changing modalities of enslavement and freedom, domination and resistance. And the overarching questions really raised by this are enduring ones, as I found out through the various sessions I've been attending at this conference. At one point, does obligation and entrustment become enslavement and, sort of, and become unendurable? And where does the free market feature in all of this? So... Um, the first section is called Articulation Again. You have to be over 50 to recognize the reference, but I'll try and explain it. <laughs> life in debt, and here I'm consciously parodying Clara Hand's book, life in debt in South Africa is not pure slavery. Instead, it has an ambivalent character. For the likes of Margo Jane's children, as Clara Hand found out for Chile, access to credit allows people to live a life of consumerism and aspiration from which they were previously excluded, but they are also aware that theirs is a loaned life. In some comparative cases from the global south that I've come across, um, the debt conundrum juxtaposes apparently unlike sets of values. You've got cherished and non-commodified family relations on the one hand, but these both induce and are subject to the inexorable force of commodified payment plus interest on the other. And the enduring question, I think, which we still haven't solved is, in the articulation between these two, do we have to establish which is dominant? Um, can we allow them to sort of coexist in some uncomfortable relationship? Do we have to presume some commensurability between them in order for things to convert between the one and the other? So Parker Shipton, in his book, The Nature of Entrustment, maintains that the lure of Kenya are at times profit-seeking marketeers and at times reciprocators and redistributors. This sounds like a kind of conceptual binary in which people have some choice to, to switch between. Jane Geyer has shown how a West African logic of economic activity dovetailed with, while also sometimes countermanding a capitalist one. She speaks of a setting where magical conceptions about money coexist with routine numeration rather than contradicting it. She talks about multiplicity rather than binary. She shows how formalization and financialization 
financialization of economic arrangements can be accompanied by the opposite, all held within the same frame, but not necessarily subject to some dominant hegemonic force originating in the capitalist West. Now, the debates about articulation of modes of production, which was happening way, way back, presumed that capitalism was dominant and it subordinated other, perhaps pre-capitalist forms. I'm still asking questions about how this actually happens. And I'm trying to move this beyond the kind of determinism which, which those earlier um, debates suggested. There's definitely been an ongoing uh, discussion in some of the sessions I've been to here, which suggests that the debtor-creditor relationship has now supplanted the um, worker-capitalist relationship. But I'm still, I think it's still up for grabs. So analyzing two phenomena as articulated might rely on them being able to separate to some extent but the material I'm going to present shows in contrast a more inextricable entanglement between debt in its non-commodified form, in terms of social obligation, and its commodified one. Um, although I don't have time to go into it in this particular paper, part of the way in which they seem to be inextricably entangled is, part, is because of the role of intermediaries and agents um, in, in this whole process. And this, hence also the complicity story. So when I first started thinking about this, I looked for um, the local models for debt in South Africa, and the most readily available example is that of bride wealth payments, which, which tie people together in long-standing chains of obligation. And in one case I studied, a man attempting to position himself within that local solidarity economy by committing to bride wealth was only able to do so by incurring a huge amount of interest-bearing debt from a money lender. So it seemed as though here, um, certainly the, the non-commodified reform was driving this man into a commodified version of debt. Now, although this kind of relationship has some truth, it still seems to represent matters a little bit too starkly. You still end up confronted by a stark binary. Mutuality is good, um, commodity is bad. But I've had to rethink this. And this is partly because looking back at some of the material on marriage in Southern Africa, one realizes that the networks of reciprocity that people were involved in have actually been very enslaving. So in 1912, Henri Junot, uh, an anthropologist in the region, gave an account of hatred and bitterness between unpaid wife givers and the unpaying wife receivers against whom they were bringing civil suits in huge numbers. It wasn't necessarily because people wanted to cash in their cattle. Rather, like house buyers in a mortgage chain, the wife giving house was waiting for cattle to use in respect of its own son's marriages. But the resulting arrangements were characterized by Juno as equating to virtual enslavement. Thus, in South Africa, apparently non-capitalist exchanges and dependencies, essential in creating productive relationalities, the kind of thing we anthropologists love reading about, have nevertheless been characterized as enslaving people. In this sense, they seem rather less different from their more recently emerging counterpart, that is commodity debt, than we might have thought. But what does this modern commodity debt look like in practice, and can we learn anything from comparing it with similar cases across the South? So this section is called Middle Classing and Debt Across the South. So the ambiguities of indebtedness for the Chilean poor have already been described, but a similar set of ambiguities are true, and even more trenchantly so, for middle classes, as I'm going to call them, classers as opposed to classes. The cases that I'm going to describe here briefly, that is South Africa, Malawi, as described by Gerhard Anders, and India, as described by Johnny Parry, show some striking similarities. And this suggests that global conditions have imposed certain universally shared characteristics upon newly indebted members of this category. So first of all, in all three cases and many others beyond that I've heard about here as well, um, there's a huge amount of reliance on state salaries paid directly or indirectly by the states. Um, in, the, in the case of South Africa, these were newly acquired through the changing racial composition of the civil service. In the case of Malawi, people were clinging on to these jobs despite recent cuts to state spending, while in the Indian case, they were employees in a public sector steel plant rather than being um, sort of public workers uh, more formally told. In all these settings where class status was only recently acquired was being particularly vulnerable and tenuous, the imperative of status distinction that Bourdieu describes is accompanied by the imperative to offer support to those from whom you are thus distinguished. 
Okay, now this is because this liberalization of the economy has eradicated income sources for those neighbors or kinsmen. And this is actually explicitly spoken of in South Africa as the black tax. You have to pay for your relatives because you realize that you are better off than, than they are. It's with a certain irony, obviously. Okay, um, so the salaries then are relied upon to do more than simply support them and their immediate families. Partly to ensure this, they find themselves borrowing money in order to sort of, you know, meet those obligations, and they then become over-indebted. Liberalization also means that such loans are more readily available than they might have been a generation ago. So not only is there more money available, but money lenders of all kinds have acquired a much more um, speedy and more reliable system of collateral, and that is one of deducting repayments directly from the salaries of debtors. And this is true in all three of the cases that I've been studying here. So in these cases, state salaries or grants, in the case of South Africa, represent collateral. And this is one way, as Susanna has just said, that the state remains absolutely key, despite this being, in some senses, a sort of neoliberal economy. So in the South African case, who exactly are these lenders? And what is their relationship to the borrowers? In order to illustrate this, I want to just turn to a brief little fieldwork anecdote. The Kikana family lives in Soweto. Both parents, just like the children of Maro Jain, their generation two, hail from rural backgrounds. Both of them, as beneficiaries of the new order, work for a parastatal company. The mother is a very frugal person who hates the idea of credit, but she nevertheless found herself obliged to get in hock so that their daughter could attend university after finishing high school. Financial pressures meant that the university, here turned creditor, was obliged to wait until the mother got her annual bonus before the fees could be paid. If she had managed to secure the agreement of her husband, who actually thought their daughter should have gone out to work instead, it is possible that Mrs. Kikana might not have been forced to shoulder this burden alone. Mr. Kikana was making an additional income, money from nothing, that's the title for my book, as a mashonisa, a loan shark, using the salary he earned in a parastatal as a basis for his illegal money lending business, waiting outside factory gates at month end to ask borrowers for their ATM cards so as to recoup his loans plus interest from their accounts. Now, it may well have been the case that as a middle classer, he was also obliged to send money home to rural kin in the village. Um, but here, the morality of debt and credit was reversed because he appears as a predator rather than a victim. But what the story shows is that creditors cannot be easily distinguished from debtors since households may include both of these in complex intersection. In sum, then, salary here has become a multiple resource, not only one in which out-of-work relatives may call, but also, once paid from state coffers or by public companies into employees' bank accounts, a form of collateral that circulates around the system in a kind of pyramid scheme. Although not all borrowers repay their debts, a considerable number do plus interest, and this ends up in the pockets of lenders so incomes and resources are, in a number of ways, thus redistributed around the system to those not receiving them. This is one way of making living in settings perhaps misleadingly characterized as financialized or neoliberal. Through accessing state resources, money can be made from nothing. The term redistributive must then be added to neoliberal. So a brief word on the specifics of supply and demand in this particular setting. I've got a kind of a diagram here, and we need to examine, in order to understand the way in which this kind of debt credit revolutions went off, sort of set off in the 1990s, we need to understand not only the liberalization and financialization of southern economies, but also the role played by democratic transition. In Chile, Clara Hand demonstrates a relationship between that country's earlier repressive regime and the extreme pendulum swing of its subsequent liberalization. The new government's readiness to envisage the extension of credit thus has something to do with the debt borne by the state to those who had earlier been brutalized by it, and something similar was the case in South Africa. Here you have a peculiar scenario. Um, the first sector up there, mainstream um, formal financial sector, had been largely closed to most black people, except the furniture and appliance sector uh, which I mentioned earlier. People were buying from those on higher purchase. Now, 
a new rising black middle class had suddenly come into um, positions in the civil service, and they had displaced the people who used to be in that civil service, that is mainly white Afrikaans speakers. Those white Afrikaans speakers had taken the redundancy packages and started micro-lending businesses, and in a peculiar way that they were continuing to get access to the money that they used to have, except through the intermediary of these new civil servants. In addition to those formal micro-lending businesses in sector two, you had a whole series of informal micro-lenders in sector three, mostly neighborhood money lenders who'd been in existence all along, but again, really kind of started uh, ramping up their activities in the last 20 years or so. And um, this is just a kind of couple of, of pictures to illustrate that you get the store cards, which many people are now using uh, in addition to you know, regular bank loans and things like that. The old furniture stores remain absolutely key. People will pay often more than twice the price because there's also insurance added on, you know, in case you die in the middle of repaying for your fridge or, so, or whatever. Um, this just shows you the, the extent of the extraordinary credit boom that happened during the 1990s. This is actually only sector two, that, that is the new micro-lending sector. Um, and just to show you the, the role of state regulation, the state is not completely oblivious to this. They've actually tried to regulate it. And these are a series of the names of those dodgy microcredit people in, in sector two who were, in fact, extracting loans, um, extracting repayments from people using a whole series of borderline legal techniques, and they were all brought um, to, to, to book in a recent court case. Okay. So that just gives you a, a basic idea. So we have then this kind of multiple scenario. People feel both enslaved but at the same time empowered. Is there in then any kind of escape from this type of enslavement? Is there any escape from the world of debt altogether? Comparative evidence from southern settings suggests that instead of wiping the slate clean, more or different kinds of debt may provide a way out. So, for example, if you look at the Luo in Kenya, as Shipton talks about, they are profoundly entangled in debts even defined by them. If they often are slow to honor their development loans, this is not because the idea of repayment is foreign to them, but because there are more important debts to kin and other acquaintances which, might they, pay, which they might pay first. Similarly, Isabel Guerin, writing of Tamil Nadu in India, shows how women often negotiate a better position within local spaces of sociability and wealth distribution by paying one loan rather than another or using one loan to pay off another. So there's a lot of negotiation and challenge possible. And this kind of thing goes on in South Africa as well. And here, um, in these kind of middle class type scenarios. And here, at the Funeral Cl Savings Club, something which has absolutely taken off again in the last 20 years, comes into play. So, for example, oh, sorry, this is the Mashonisa. Actually, the Mashonisa doesn't have to use a club because he simply takes your ATM card and takes the money straight out of your bank account. So, this is a misleading picture of that. So, Lerata Mohali is a teacher, one of these generation two uh, civil servants. Now, she has a, a secure salaried position. She's been recently widowed, and she occupies the nodal point in a network of unemployed relatives. So she is, in effect, being required to pay that black tax that we were talking about. So what she's done is she's joined a whole series of funeral clubs, and each one of them is thought of as covering a specific relative. This not only shows that she is very attentive to the need to sort of fulfill her obligations, but in some sense she is also saving money, putting money aside for each of these people, but also by honoring obligations to one particular kinsman, she can stave off requests from others. Oh, that's, that's being put aside for auntie so-and-so, oh, that's being put aside for uncle, whatever. So there's a certain interesting kind of juggling negotiation going on in this particular case. In other words, we can use these positive-sounding suggestions about conflicting obligations, which do provide a means to negotiate relationships. We can thus revisit the story of bride wealth, which I mentioned earlier was a source of enslavement, and explore how it relates to both apparently more commodified forms of debt in South Africa, but also to what you might call blood relationships. Several anthropologists have shown, much as was observed for Juno, by Juno for an earlier period, the few nuptials are ever finalized, and marriage payments are honored often more in the breach than the observance. They have, in fact, become way more expensive than they ever were. Um, okay, sorry. 
So um, what I've shown is that a number of women not only find the idea of their, their male partner having to pay bride wealth quite off-putting, but have in fact be benefited so much from the new order that they simply don't want to get married at all. So the whole idea of marriage is tending to remain sort of on the back burner. However, this doesn't necessarily mean a relief from the sort of requirements to distribute one's income more widely. So although some people have resolved to withdraw from the complex obligations of marriage exchange, um, they nevertheless have to fulfill alternative demands from their blood relatives. And there is an interesting book written by this woman here. It's one of a great range of new self-help books on how to deal with your finances. And this woman in particular talks to people, giving them advice, do not become a cash cow. Rather focus on the future achievements and needs of your own children, because um, you know, in this way you can stave off the expectations of relatives by settling perhaps in one of the new townhouse or condominium complexes. These allow you to sort of focus in on your own family and keep the demands of other people at bay. In other words, it seems as though even if people do want to repudiate the notion of starting to pay endless amounts of money, or not, no longer cattle, but money, to in-laws, they are still going to be required to be paying for relatives and relatives' children. And I've met several people, for example, who are paying for, the, for their sister's children to go to university. Um, once again, part of this black tax that people have described. Just um, an example to show you how the price of marrying has gone up. You, know, you can now get an app on your telephone to allow you to calculate what the bride wealth will be. <laughs> and it shows you the different rates uh, around the country. And, and this is just a joke. This is a, a sort of film that was made about a, a white family contracting a marriage with, with a black family, and they're facing off over the cow, which is symbolic of the bride wealth, uh, over which they are actually disputing in this particular case. And then a marvelous uh, tweet that I came across, which I think says it all. I itch for the day will realize there's no middle class, but an imaginary gap filled by people deep in debt trying to prove they aren't poor. <laughs> so it sounds then, just to conclude, as though debt can only really be evaded by selecting between alternative kinds of owing. Such tactics cannot be effective for long, perhaps. But can social movements unify the indebted and make for a longer-term solution in their place? The fees must fall. Student protests, in which some members of the third generation have participated, show that many, par many parents, unlike the Kekanas, whom I mentioned earlier, either lack a regular income or the strategic savvy to choose between competing priorities. Debts to banks and short-term high-interest microlenders are incurred, and non-repayment is very common, and, and also to universities. The movement has secured some promises of relief to indebted graduates and future scholars, but the question is left unanswered of how the university sector and these middle classes in general will ultimately be supported. And this is just a quote from Ashil Mbembe, who is sort of calling on the fact that something needs to be done about the global financialization of existence. I'll leave you to read for yourselves. As he says, it is systemic. It's just as systemic as the wives' or cattle system that it replaced and that it's been kind of combined with. But what I've tried to show in this lecture is some of the complex interweavings of market and non-market obligations and also of liberalizing and redistributive impulses that underpin the situation. So I don't think that capitalism on its own offers an adequate explanation, and I still haven't decided whether we can ever say that the commodified debt or the non-commodified debt is sort of more important in this newfangled articulation that is going on. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. Um, let me introduce our third and last speaker. Uh, Noam Uran is a philosopher at Ben Gurion University, philosopher in Tel Aviv. And he specializes in political economy. And his book, his recent book, What Money Wants, An Economy of Desire, published at Stanford University Press, conceptualizes money as an object of desire. 
and he's currently working on a book project about the libidinal economy of capitalism and studies the ethical substance of money. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here out of my discipline. The term prostitution is sometimes used as a metaphor for the ills of capitalist economy. Marx writes that prostitution is only a particular expression of the universal prostitution of the worker. I want to follow uh, this usage of the term and inquire in what manner prostitution is symptomatic to a broader view of capitalism. It is symptomatic, I argue, to what I call the libidinal or the sexual economy of capitalism. By this phrase, I want to point at two interrelated ideas. First, that capitalism is characterized by unique ways in which desire, erotic, gender identities, gender relations are articulated, expressed, and encoded in the world of money and goods. And second, that in capital capitalism, that capitalism is characterized by a unique economy that informs gender relations. I will state right now the basic principle of this economy as I see it. Its basic principle is that in capitalism, uh, gender relations are formally excluded from the sphere of exchange. While in many pre-capitalist societies, marriage is considered an economic arrangement, sometimes in the form of a purchase of a wife, in capitalism, this possibility is considered extremely obscene. But the fact that it is obscene attests that it is not simply eradicated from reality. Rather, it suggests that in its formal absence, it keeps informing economic practices and imagination. Anthropological research would be most valuable to this study, but I am not an anthropologist. What I can offer you today is a philosophical economic inquiry of this theme. The question I ask is, what economic theory can account for the gendered aspect of capitalism? This would clearly not be contemporary orthodox economics. At its theoretical level, economics today is gender neutral. The agent on which economic theory is modeled today is universal and abstract, lacking any social distinctions. But that wasn't always the case. If we turn to the history of economic thought, we can find them we can find there some perspectives, perspectives which were eventually excluded from the discipline, and which allow us to inscribe gender already at the theoretical level. So I would turn to them in order to inquire whether we can conceive of gender economy as an economic theory. And I think that is what I can offer you as an outsider. Maybe some of you are suspicious of economics, and maybe it, it is rightly so, but what I suggest is that you try to broaden uh, the perspective, look, to look beyond the currently very narrow limits of economic theory and look at the history of economic thought, which provides some uh, different conceptualizations of the economy. I will talk about three things. First, about prostitution. Uh, uh, I will examine some occurrences of the term prostitution in economic thought, in early economic thought. And in some metaphorical and literal senses, prostitution, that's what I will show, designates an alternative theoretical ground for economics. It designates a radically different economy than the one we are accustomed to think of. Second, I will apply this alternative theory to the cont contemporary cultural logic with, that associates finance and prostitution. And third, and very briefly, I will broaden the view to present prostitution as symptomatic to capitalism. The references to prostitution I will examine can be roughly classified as patriarchal perspectives or fantasies. As such, they do not tell us much about the reality of women in prostitution. Yet it would be wrong to simply dismiss them. What I think, what I believe, is that an understanding of prostitution cannot be complete without dwelling on the weight of male fantasies invested in it. So to set the stage, I want to go back to the very beginning of modern economic thought. 
the theme of prostitution loomed at a key moment in the early economic thought. In Bernard Manville, a very successful text, The Fable of the Bees, from the beginning of the 19th, 18th century, prostitution together with a whole range of gender issues, marriage, concubinage, courting, lust, fornication, so prostitution is one of the recurring themes through which Manville imagines the workings of uh, the economy. His text occupies a very complex position in the history of economics. Thomas Horn uh, described it, that's the book, as a silent reference point uh, for much of the 18th century social thought. It was a reference point because Mandeville provided a sharp formulation of the moral paradox of capitalism, which keeps fascinating economists to this very day. The notion that the activity of individual con contributes to the prosperity of the con community, regardless of their own motivations. The beehive in Mandeville's fable is inflicted with almost all of the deadly scenes, lust, pride, gluttony, avarice, loss and envy, only wrath is missing. While these scenes are lamented by the inhabitants of the hive, they are actually the key to its economic prosperity. As honesty descends upon the hive, its flourishing economy quickly disintegrates. This idea is summarized in the famous subtitle of the fable in Mandeville's formula, private vices, public benefits. This formula received later on its canonical expression in Adam Smith's idea of the invisible hand. But what should interest us today is the difference between these two formulations. Mantville eventually became not just a reference point, but a silent reference point, because his text is maybe the most obscene text uh, in the history of economic thought. He is fascinated with the vices that propel activity. Envy itself and vanity were ministers of industry. Smith discarded of vices and focused instead on morally neutral self-seeking activity. The prostitutes, harlots, concubines who populated Manville's world were substituted in Smith with bakers, brewer, brewers and butchers. And this is a simple word count I conducted in the two texts. <laughs> and the point is, <laughs> The point is that economic theory itself must be somehow different, whether you imagine it with bakers and brewers or with prostitutes. So to get a glimpse of this difference, uh, let's see how Smith and Manville formalize exchange. What is exchange and what are its benevolent uh, results? So that is, what, that is what Smith's very famous ver version. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Mandeville's version is quite different. A highwayman, that is a sort of a robber, having met with a considerable booty, gives a poor common harlot he fancies 10 pounds to new rigor from top to toe. Is there a spruce mercer so conscientious that he will refuse to sell her a thread satin though he knew who she was. What should be noted is that Smith and Mandeville set different aims for economic inquiry. Smith limits his interest to the question, how is exchange possible? The baker wants meat, the butcher wants bread, and so they exchange. His choice of basic goods reveals what he, like most economists since, do not want to acquire, to inquire. What happens with exchange and after it, what are the social relations fabricated with commerce? But that is ex ex exactly what interests Mandeville and the reason that his text is so obscene. He does not focus solely on the way passions propel economic activity, but also on the way they flow through the economy, expressed and motivated by commerce. The mercer may identify the harlot, but sell her the setting nonetheless. Exchange may be propelled by illicit passions, money makes exchange possible, but it cannot completely purge it. Their origin 
colors exchange and may be carried over through it. For that reason, it is very important to really carefully read Smith's rare references to prostitution. They disclose the theoretical significance of his choice to conceptualize the economy with bakers and brewers, meat and bread. Smith uses prostitution in a metaphorical sense in order to explain the exorbitant rewards of players, opera singers, and opera dancers. Well, I'll paraphrase a little bit. So that's what he says. Uh, some players that get such high, uh, uh, earn so much money because there are some very agreeable, agreeable and beautiful talent, talents which are usually admired. But when they are ex exercised for the sake of gain, they are considered as a sort of public prostitution. The reward in such cases is high because it pays not only for the time, labor, the expense of acquiring the talents, but also for the discredit, the discredit which attends the employment of them as means of subsistence. This is a remarkable moment. I suspect that in this incidental remark, Adam Smith comes closer to understanding capitalism than in the rest of his theory. Prostitution designates here a unique economy, radically different than the concept of economy familiar to us. It hermetically ties together an alternative ethical view of money with an alternative ground for economic theory. In the ethical aspect, Smith provides here a rigorous de economic definition of the obscenity of money. Prostitution designates an economy where money is not a neutral means of exchange, as economics constantly teaches us since then. Prostitution designates an economy where money is uh, where money is in, um, it's social it refers to a, 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 context, a context where the social, of, a social function of money includes a prohibition. There are some things that should not be sold and bought for money. But this prohibition marks money as an obscene object because these things are sold for more money. There are things that should not be sold and bought, and therefore they are expensive. Money, in other words, is the means to overcome the prohibitions inherent in its own social function. But the first crucial point is that this ethical view conceptually implies a unique theoretical grounds for economic thought. It points to the, at the need of a theory which diverges, diverges from the perspective, the common perspective, where exchange necessarily involves equivalence. The metaphor of, of prostitution designates an economy where money systematically upsets, upsets equivalence. Smith indeed wants to reinstate equivalence, the additional payment to occupation considered public prostitution compensates for discredit. But this addition cannot re restore the framework, the familiar uh, uh, framework of uh, equivalence if we keep in mind that the discredit results from the fact of money exchange and not from the nature of the occupations. So to follow the logic of Smith, prostitution marks exchanges, very strange exchanges, where one pays for paying, where the fact of paying requires additional payment. Uh, Smith uses the term prostitution metaphorically. Much later we find his argument resurfaces in relation to prostitution proper in Walter Benjamin's uh, Arcades project. In this immense exploration of 19th century Paris, prostitution is part of the landscape of new commercial spaces and practices that reshaped the city. In a section dedicated to prostitution and gambling, Benjamin refers to the, the dialectical function of money in prostitution. The exchange between clients and prostitutes, he writes, cannot be apprehended if money is thought of only as a mean of, means of payment. It buys pleasures and at the same time becomes an expression of shame. In the exchange involved, impudence throws the first coin onto the table and shame, pay, pay, shame pays out a hundred more to cover it. Paying is shameful and a further, a further payment covers the shame. The shame reddened wooden, 
wound on the body of society, secretes money and closes up. Excuse me. Who closed it? Between the met metaphorical and the literal, there emerges a discomforting possibility that prostitution, prostitution may be an important perspective of, on capitalist economy as such. One exchange is excluded from the its circle of equivalence, and further ones, metaphorically contaminated by it, follow its steps in exchanges marked by upset equivalence. How do we theorize economy then? Should we exclude from theory the upsetting exchanges, or rather theorize economy in relation to them? Smith does not expand on this strange economy. He designates public prostitution focuses back, right back on beer, meat, and bread. But in principle, his whole system has al al already collapsed. It is enough that some exchanges upset equivalence for the paradigm of universal equivalence not to hold. It is enough that in relation to some exchanges, the function of money is intertwined uh, uh, with a prohibition for its view as a neutral means to collapse. The question is whether the concept, the, the question is whether the concept of economy designated and rejected by the metaphor of prostitution is the correct ground for understanding capitalism. So the question at stake in prostitution is of the highest theoretical consequences also for economic theory, whether the economy should conceived under the concept of equivalence or through the upsetting of equivalence. Orthodox economics, beginning with Smith, chose unequivocally, unequivocally the idea that exchange must involve equivalence. Equivalence. This notion lies at the basis of contemporary economics, unquestionable belief in the fairness of markets. More broadly, it accounts for the blindness, blindness of the discipline to the social. We already see what Smith had to exclude from the study of the economy in order to constitute the framework of equivalence. He excluded culture, singers, opera dancers. He also excluded luxury, the main theme of Mandeville. So he excluded also luxury with the passions, vices, and social relations in it involves. Bread and meat instead of the hollowed satin. Turning outside orthodox economics, we can find the idea that money upsets equivalence in the work of Marx. In an early text, he claims, money, inasmuch as it possesses the property of being able to buy everything and appropriate all objects, is the object most worth possess possessing. Now, this claim refers to just to the basic structure of monetary economy, an economy where one object serves as a means of purchase for all other objects, the exclusive mean of, means of payment. This structure led economics to conclude that money is neutral medium, which sustains universal equivalence of all other goods. We can also see the logic that led to this conclusion. However, the, the, the interesting point is that Marx looks at the same basic structure and proposes a completely different interpretation of it. In, his interpre in Marx's interpretation, money fundamentally upsets equivalence, precisely because it is equivalent to all commodities, it is superior to all commodities. And the point is uh, that there is a reason also to, his, to, to Marx's interpretation. Money is superior to all the commodities it can purchase because, simply because it can purchase other commodities as well. A one dollar note is actually more valuable than a one dollar can of Coke because with the dollar, we can buy a can of Coke, an indefinite number of other commodities. But the point is that this superiority of money cannot be formalized under the, uh, the idea of that value is inherently related to equivalent, equivalence. Now, this comment of Marx is not directly related to prostitution, but in a closer scrutiny, we can associate it with it. The preference of money over goods is the standard economic explanation of interest. At some point, some people prefer not to use their money to buy goods, 
in order to have more money in the future. Before capitalism, this conduct carried a distinct obscene nature. In the Middle Ages, it was banned by the church. And the interesting point is that it was morally denounced together with prostitution. Interest, and post interest lending and prostitution were listed together because of the common relation to barrenness. Prostitution is unproductive sex. Ten minutes, okay. Oh. And lending with interest infringes the barrenness of money. It is a case where money begets, a perverse case where money begets money. Today, interest no longer appear obscene. However, its association with prostitution resurfaces in a different form. It is apparent in the cultural association between finance, another way of making money for money, and prostitution. A prominent example, in a minute we'll look at, we will look at it, is Martin Scorsese's uh, movie, The Wolf from Wall Street, that dwells in the excessive lifestyle of Wall Street traders. But if you want to notice the specificity of the association of finance and prostitution, we should recall an older romantic movie. Uh, I'm thinking of Gary Marshall's Pretty Woman. It, uh, the, the, I hope you remember it. Yeah. Uh, it begins, the movie begins with a relationship between a prostitute, Julia Roberts, and a financier, Richard Gere. The financier is a typical Reagan-era corporate raider who makes his fortune by liquidating companies in debt. The narrative sees the relationship mature into a love affair, culminating in a double conversion. The financier, Gear, decides for the first time in his life to initiate a recovery plan for a business he has taken over, and in parallel assume the role, assumes the role of a romantic lover giving up his previous suggestion that Roberts would remain his kept woman. That is to say, finance is associated with prostitution and industrial, econ industrial capital with love. Uh, in order to explain this association, I want to show a short scene from the wolf of, uh, from Wall Street. So how do I screen it? <clears throat> the abuse of prostitution has little, in this movie has little to do with sexual enjoyment. It is a compulsory activity, as evident in the trader's commitment to explore the whole spectrum, including its disgusting form, skanks as they call them, and the dangerous aspect. Take a penicillin shot and pray that your dick didn't fall. It is a ritualistic act of breaking taboos and walls of shame together, a conduct that binds people together no less than commitment to shared values. It, has, it articulates their commitment to the firm's business credo of making money at all costs. Don't be, be, hang up until the client either dies or buys. But what is more important is that they categorize prostitutes by prices and name them after categories of stocks. This suggests that the trader's abuse of prostitution has to do with money I just simply read it literally. It has to do with money no less than with sex. Marx's Marx view of money that we saw earlier supports this possibility. Prostitution provides an experiential counterpart to the power of money as the universal means of exchange. It consummates this function of money by demonstrating that money can buy everything, including sex. Following Marx, if money is superior to goods, because it can appropriate all goods, the no good can provide an experience of the power of money. On the contrary, the purchase of goods abolishes the unlimited potential of money. Constitution demonstrates this potential precisely because sex should not be bought. So it is not that the traders want sex and therefore they buy it. What they want is to buy sex, buying sex as a monetary experience, an erotic, an erotic relation to money. This possibility is supported also by the strange vicissitude of the moral condemnation of prostitution. In its condemnation in pre-capitalist uh, societies mixed various moral and economic grounds. It was abhorred as an economic exchange, but also on various other moral grounds, lechery, fornication, 
extramarital sex, unproductive sex, indulgence in corporal pleasure, sexual relations between strangers, all these grounds more or less disappeared in our lenient societies, which makes the interdiction that still holds very strange. In capitalism, this interdiction is of a purely monetary nature. The exchange of sex from, for money, the purchase of sex from women by men. Against this background, we cannot avoid the strange conclusion that prostitution has to do with our ethic of money no less or even more than it has to do with our ethic of sex. So, how much time do I have more? Should I? <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, uh, Smith, strange economy of public prostitution resurfaces in the movie in a different form. Prostitution, again, designates the economy of what should not be sold and bought. The traders abuse it because sex should not be bought. And again, in this economy, money is extracted from its role as a medium of exchange. Payment from the, for the traders is no longer an equivalent for what they want to purchase. Payment is the experience they seek in prostitution. In this sense, they also, like in Adam Smith's idea, they also pay for paying. Payment is part of their enjoyment. This fictional representation may have to do with the real abuse of uh, prostitution. Catherine McKinnon writes that prostituted people pay for paid sex. What she means by that is that pay, paid sex is a unique type of sex, a sexual experience of domination, as she calls it, a do what I say sex. But we should not miss the implication of her claim for economic, economic theory. What she describes is another form of exception of the notion of money as a neutral medium. In prostitution, money shapes the service provided for money. So I will skip that more specific question, why, why, why prostitution uh, is related specifically to finance, and I will try to, with, with a few words, to go to the uh, broader uh, implication the association between finance and prostitution may be symptomatic to a broader view of capitalism. I, and I can really, really briefly outline this possibility. I want to recall a half-forgotten uh, history of capitalism, Werner Zombard's Luxury and Capitalism. This book traces the origin of capitalism to a transformation in the relations between the sexes, with the rise of the cult of love in the Renaissance. The emergence of a semi-formal class of courtesans and concubines, he argues, involved the, the practice of luxury gifts given by courtiers. As this new class came to set the standards of consumption for the broader circles of society, it propelled luxury industry, which eventually drove the economy from its stable traditional patterns toward capitalism. As he summarized it, Luxury then, itself a legitimate child of illicit love, gave rise to capitalism. It is a sentence that I read and said, this book is a must read. I don't know what it means, but I have to find out. So there are some, actually, some very good reason why Zombart was dismissed. It can be easily read as a misogynistic expression of anxiety of capitalism, yet it may deserve a charitable reason, uh, reading as an account of the unique gender economy of capitalism. Gender's, uh, Zombat's thesis appears as a wild speculation because he present it, presents it as a causal explanation where feminine demand for luxury driven by sexual desires actually propelled the economy. However, dismissing this presumption to causality, his historical research, and he does provide a very um, detailed historical research, so his historical research can be read as an interesting exploration of how desire, erotic, and gender relation, relations are encoded and expressed in new ways in the world of capitalist money and goods. Instead of the idea that desire for luxury propelled the economy, it can be read as exploring how goods become eroticized in capitalism. Zombat argues that love emerged in the Renaissance through an opposition to marriage. It was opposed to the religious, religious regulation of sex, but more importantly, 
to the conception of marriage as an economic arrang arrangement aimed at furthering the stability of the household. When illicit love itself was institutionalized with semi-formal class of courtesans and concubines, it acquired itself an economic aspect epitomized in the luxury gift. In this economy, we find one more form of the strange economy we followed, the economy of public uh, prostitution, the economy that entangles what cannot be bought with money that upsets equivalence. Insofar as it has an economic aspect, love embodies what cannot be bought, articulated in the gift that demands no return, at least not explicitly. That these gifts are luxury goods manifests again the economic logic that what cannot be bought demands an extra cost. In the luxury gift, therefore, one is another form of paying for paying. With the luxury gift, one, the courtier pays for paying. Do I have time to? Do? So instead of concluding, to conclude, instead of summarizing, I just want to screen a short commercial, which actually uh, captures the whole of my argument, makes my, the whole of my lecture a bit redundant. It is a, a, a commercial for, for a very expensive car. Gorgeous. A car which is sold as something Gorgeous. expensive. That is another form of paying for paying. Gorgeous. Of it is your uh, immediate attention. Of course, Gorgeous it, makes effort. It appear, women appears it, as its equivalent. Equivalent. Gorgeous stays up late and still looks gorgeous. But what I want you to notice is this. Gorgeous has no love for life. This woman, women, gorgeous appear in a very specific, specific, specific form. They appear as singular, unexchangeable, gorgeous unique. Says. Gorgeous gets in everywhere. Gorgeous can't be ordinary, even if it tries. Gorgeous pays for itself in the first five seconds. Gorgeous doesn't care at all what others are doing. Gorgeous was born that way. Gorgeous trumps everything. Gorgeous is worth it. So, it's just one more form of the strange economy I was following, uh, a woman, women, as what cannot be bought, that symbolizes paying for paying. Thank you. We have a uh, like 20 minutes or so for uh, a few questions. Um, just want to recommend to keep your questions short and concise. We're not forced to ask questions. Oh, there is one. Okay, thank you for interesting lectures or papers or whatever you want to call them. Um, this question for Deborah James and for anyone else who wants to uh, answer it. Um, Dr. James, in your paper you talk about um, mainly about debt for household consumption or the forging of social links through a, for example, bribe. Um, and you mentioned the fees must fall movement. Uh, a popular response to the expansion of, of higher education, private and public, is the expansion of student debt. Now, is that a factor in um, the debt explosion in post-apartheid South Africa? And if so, how does this help to structure 
intergenerational relationships, class relationships, the sense of being middle class, the process of middle classing, etc. Sorry, I, I didn't hear the word before the debt. You said that the new system is, involves what kind of debt? Uh, student debt. Student debt. debt yes. School fees, related fees, etc. Yeah. Um, the, I, th I think the answer to that one is that it's still very early days. Um, it was turned into a very big, big politicized sort of request. And in fact, in addition to simply going to ask the universities to solve the problem, students went right to the gates of parliaments and requested some sort of, basically, that they fund the universities more robustly than previously. Uh, there is no real student loan system or, or, or not enough to, to sort of operate like the equivalent version in the UK. So. There's a kind of uneasy truce right now, but a lot will, will hint on what actually gets hammered out in the next little while. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Norm. Um, well, you, you, you talked about the libido and economy of capitalism, but I was wondering about subject. Um, in your libido, libido economy of capitalism, there was not, not much space, I thought, maybe it escaped me, for subjectivity. And I was, I kept on thinking about two things, really. Um, the one is David Harvey's The Logic of Capital and the way that some anthropologists have questioned it in the way that, well, the capital doesn't have a, a logic of itself, it's not a subject. There's people behind it. There's certain forces that are intrinsic to capital, but there's also subjects behind it. And one can think of Yanagi Sato and Marcus and whatnot. But uh, in anthropology, but obviously um, outside anthropology, there's also other sort of critiques. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, Krugman's famous article that says, back in the day when, you know, at the beginning of the sovereign debt crisis, so called in Southern Europe, um, he wrote this article saying, well, the markets are questioning Greece, the markets are questioning Portugal, blah, blah, blah. And I, I'm, I'm, my, my students keep on asking me, who are these markets? And I always say, um, the, the markets are white dudes after prostitutes and cocaine. So I was wondering about this subjectivity, behind, this masculine, ultra masculine subjectivity behind um, your, uh, what way it fits in your, in your uh, framework. Yeah. One reason that I uh, won't consider uh, Zombart, despite of its explicit uh, misogyny, is that he, like some other economists, Mandeville is maybe the beginning of this uh, tradition, Veblen is another one. So one reason is that he uh, puts the priority on luxury. Luxury as the primary stuff of capitalism, not as uh, a sec secondary. You know, the usual economic uh, perspective sees needs as the primary stuff, and then luxuries. It has a lot of suspicion at luxuries, but there is a good reason to uh, consider luxury as uh, the primary stuff, at least of capitalism, because capitalism involves the, uh, this constant uh, uh, process where luxuries become needs and new luxury takes their place. And, the, uh, and I say it in uh, relation to your question, because luxury is very, is very interesting because it is a very uh, clear example of the way objects entail subjectivity. That, is, that something is luxury necessarily entails some a complicated subjective relation to it. Uh, so if you, re if, if you follow this tradition of economists uh, putting the emphasis on luxury, uh, I think that is the correct way to think how, of, of the way capitalism is entangled with subjectivity. And it's the correct way because it uh, allows you to situate subjectivity at the level of objects, which is the 
I think the most important thing. And regarding Krugman's uh, joke, well, when they joke, they can say uh, 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 smart things. The question is, you will not find it in his theory. Okay, kind of a question that may be related to more than one of the papers. We speak of balanced reciprocity becoming negative reciprocity in debt. You have spoken of prostitution as that which cannot be purchased because it has no equivalence. What about the current, shall we say, witch hunt for sex offenders? where sex is not purchased for pain or otherwise, but rather is stolen and often for the sake of pain rather than pleasure. That is to say, particularly those acts where women and anyone else is mutilated sexually with something other than a part of the body. Um, so where does that fit in the libidinal, libidinal economy is it closer to balanced reciprocity? Is it negative reciprocity? And what has that to do with equivalence? Well, I, I don't know whether it is. <laughs> no, I, I, apart from it, I don't know the subject. I, I, I don't see its uh, relation. Is there an economy there? Because in prostitution, there is a very interesting economy, something that should not be bought, and therefore payment becomes the issue. But in your Excuse me. Uh -huh. So it's, uh, it, it is done for money. It goes yes. back to well. the, the oldest of the theft economies, and yeah. that is slavery, white prostitution, yeah. black pimp, 80% equivalent. Yeah, well, I think it's, it, it brings to extreme the logic that McKinnon points at, that prostitution is about domination it's about the it's 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 not about sex it's a fantasy of a complete ownership that fant that prostitution in capitalism i think i think it it, it would be different in pre-capitalist society but in, in capitalism prostitution is about a fantasy of uh, uncontrollable domination so i think it it, it, it simply brings it to extreme i, I hope that uh, answered something. Uh, um, it, it is my turn. I'm here. Uh, I had a very simple question um, to all of you, um, and it is about the notion of alienation um, that was used, of course, by Marx. Um, alienation to the extent in our time that um, the, not, the idea of subjectivity and agency is, does, is non-existent since um, human is no longer in charge. Um, the, the system that rules conditions uh, social life and we can, as, as Deborah says, takes this ambivalent position of delayed capitalism. So I'm, I'm wondering whether whether alienation can be useful today in this context that you were you were discussing, and my my question to this uh, philosopher economist um, was, I am wondering how much money did the taxpayer pay for your research uh, to go and do research about what you just showed in this scene, and I think your idea of prostitution has no philosophical um, definition behind it because. What you showed is pure, you know, absolute journalistic view of, of prostitution. And it's a kind of reductionist, a very simplified interpretation of what Marx or, or, or Smith said about economy. And so I'm wondering, you know, what kind of accountability or responsibility do you take towards the money you receive for that research? 
So the question is, how much money did I get paid? Yeah. Hi. Um, in the case that, that I was talking about, I think although there's a lot of a sense uh, the use of the word slavery and, and other kinds of things like that, human subjects remain very much at the center of the issue. And the reason why people feel strong kind of pressure, in a sense, is because of the fact that humans are demanding payment. It, it could either be a, an informal money lender, in which case um, people often think, well, the ones in my community are the ones that, that understand me. So there's some sort of sense that I owe them, but at the same time, I'm pressurized. In the case of relatives who are asking for payment, there's again a strong human connection. So I think alienation in this case is not the right word, but in a way it's driving people into commodified debt and there perhaps alienation is, is more to the point. Yes, yes, sir. I also have a question. Um, to Noah, uh, first of all, thanks for your fascinating talk about the connection between capitalism and sex. And I had the impression from your talk that this is mainly about um, men owning uh, women or men paying for sex with women. And I was wondering about the absence in your talk about the notion of gender and Either maybe you want to comment about this or maybe have examples about male prostitution and their connection to capitalism. Well, uh, there is male prostitution. What, what, what is absent is uh, female clients. What, what, what we don't have is female clients of prostitution. Uh, the clients are always men. That is the gender aspect of it. Uh, the fantasy is a fantasy of owning a woman. Uh, and if you go outside economic theory, well, outside orthodox economic theory, it's, it's very interesting to know that this idea uh, runs in some more or less systematic theories. It appears also, in the most systematic way, it appears in uh, Thorsten Veblen's uh, economic, economic, economic theory. Hi, I have a question for Susanna, over here. Hi, uh, Susanna, thank you very much for like, presenting these this two faces of the very same system where like, they, like, are connected, like, like this, this system like, based on like, monopoly of big corporations and on the other hand, like this um, idea of, of, of uh, competition like for small companies and, 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 and labor, etc., and how they might be connected through the fiscal crisis that one of the sides generate. I just wanted to ask you, from your research, how does it help us explain why this system is reproduced once and again when we have like general elections to vote for the politicians that are actually responsible for reproducing this system that is so damaging for labor. How does it help us understand what happened in Spain, for example, just a few weeks ago? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so, I mean, that's that's something of what I was trying to like get to. Um, obviously, this is kind of a preliminary uh, thoughts that I've I presented here. But um, I think that this idea of of micro privilege, in a way, or um, like th this this 
kind of of using uh, the political leverage or, or, or local brokers or, or this kind of, of exclusionary uh, practices in order to just get something that is needed for you know making a, a, a very basic uh, kind of living can explain something that we used to call and maybe we have to in a way change the way we perceive it uh, patronage and, and clientelism. I, I think we are um, witnessing a, a new kind of clientelism which, which in a way would help I think maybe explain both these exclusionary uh, um, uh, movements that are being very, very uh, uh, strong everywhere in the Western world, uh, at least, um, and probably also in, in places like India, for example, uh, very, uh, very saliently also. Um, uh, and also would explain this kind of, of voting or, or the Brexit, Brexit voting. Um, I, I think that's what I'm trying to, to um, understand, how um, a different kind of struggle is connected to a different, let's say, kind of, of capital accumulation process. We have time for one more question. Hello? Hello. Um, so I'm coming back to the critique on prostitution talk and the gender relations. So um, there are female clients. There are female clients to male sex workers. There are female clients to female sex workers. So um, in general, I think this is very, very important to not just mention, yeah, it's sex that's being bought or whatever, but to look specifically what kind of sex. I mean, the theories you were presenting, they're presuming prostitution is you have male, uh, female prostitutes, the male client, which probably is the minority, so it's not a majority. But still, what's going on there is it's a specific version of sexuality this is bought, a specific version of you know, fantasies of what is being bought, what... So it's not the gender dimension is really, really strong in there. And I think just saying, yeah, there are no female clients, that's, no, that's just not the case. And um, you really have to look carefully in what exactly, from a gender perspective, is it that's being exchanged here. Okay. I get, uh, what is that? Okay, thank you. Um, oh, it's louder than I thought. Uh, the, the question really is all to three, and I was, uh, through the final paper, I was thinking back, and thank you for saying there are female clients. There are, of course, male clients for male sex workers as well. Um, having lived in central Manchester, there are clients for every kind of sex work. Uh, but my question really goes back to, to, to all three. One of the things that was being played in different ways in all three uh, was questions of social relations and, and how they are affected by these kinds of changes that are going on. Uh, I was reminded of uh, Georg Zimmel's famous statement, money is an acid that, uh, that acts as an acid that breaks uh, relations. And we've seen lots of critiques of that, that that's not always the case and it's not very well understood. But I think the question is, uh, how does debt transform um, the nature of social relations? And this is a question really of scale. It came originally from listening to Susanna's question, uh, Susanna's presentation about how uh, relating the kind of the idea of the relation and the ideal of it with what happens in people's personal households creates a, a kind of a people trying to think through what what is changing about the nature of the social relation at a private level that is sort of refracted through what happens at that much larger scale. 
And, and I, there, was a, there was a version of that, I thought, also uh, uh, in Deborah's paper uh, about, about somehow people struggling to see what is the link or the separation between their own personal household lives in terms of relations and how debt and money and exchange gets involved with that and the transformations in it and how that relates to this bigger level. I don't know the answer, that's why I'm asking. So, um, yes, uh, well, I think it's, it's very much what you said, what I tried to do, this, this kind of, of, of relating at different scales the intimate relations of exchange and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in fact, reciprocity with uh, larger movements um, and, and, and forms of, of accumulation. So, um, I mean, I, I, I don't really know what else I could, I could say about it. I, I just um, think that it's not, I mean, for us, we've been thinking about these relationships always as, in a way, separated or different from the other kinds of relationships. And I think they are at one level, but at the other level they are, and I think that's what Deborah also was trying to show, at the other level they are completely integrated in a kind of expropriation, so to speak, um, which for me is, is, is very clear. And the kind of, of closing also, you know, like um, closing the intimate to other uh, possible uh, forms of exchange to the extension of the intimate, so to speak. So, Thank you, Sarah, for, for bringing some liberty into the debate. Um, I, think, I think, actually, I was at a session earlier on today in which somebody was saying, it's not really interesting to talk about debt as such. It's interesting to talk about debt in relation to specific circumstances. So the fact that, as I found out, so many people are getting to debt around the world suggests that a whole series of circumstances have started to exist in those settings. In my case, it's a democratic transition. It's accompanied by um, the fact of certain people going up the social ladder and a whole bunch of other people going down, and therefore this intensified pressure on their connections. It's the fact of huge new technologies which enable repayment, particularly the, the use of the salary as a sort of collateral. So there are a whole series of things to, which put together make debt have a particular form in this place. And there's no evidence actually that the advice of that woman who said, you know, don't let yourself be a cash cow, become a totally individualized family, is actually bearing fruit. Um, so it seems as though these feelings of the, of the black tax, the guilt tax, are still playing through and, and ultimately people are feeling the need to um, sort of respect those obligations but at the same time, you know, feel resentful about them. I, I, there are all kinds of uh, prostitution. I'm sure that even normal men, men buying from women, as itself very uh, various uh, forms. I, I guess there are some people who buy sex because they need sex. They don't want, it's not an, a, a, an ex, a monetary experience for them. But I'm interested in this aspect, this aspect where prostitution is an exception, where we can think of economy from the perspective of uh, prostitution. Okay, well, th thank you very much for coming, and uh, the plenary B is over. I hope I can see you tomorrow for plenary C. Uh, some time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.